In this episode, we are going to be doing a deeper dive into how I'm using inheritance in Godot. This is a follow-up video to my previous video where I kind of did a high-level discussion on where you should and should not use inheritance. That video got a lot of good feedback and I also got a lot of comments saying that this was a mistake. So if you were triggered by that last video, here is your chance to look at all of the code I've written and completely fight it in the comments. But for those of you who are following along the tutorial, I think it is necessary that I go over this so in future videos you're not kind of left out in the cold. <laughs> As a reminder, all of this code is on my GitHub page. I believe I'm going to show all of the classes and talk about them at least a little bit at some point, but because we're not doing a step-by-step -step tutorial, you would have to pause the video and kind of follow along at some point. I recommend you go and check out the classes that we've re rewritten here in the interactions directory here. So go ahead and check that out. This video is going to be a lot less edited than what I usually produce. Um, all of my recording and audio footage at some point got corrupted and I lost probably about four hours worth of work on this video, annoyingly enough. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of do a quick ramble through talking about what's going on, edit it slightly and put it out so we can move on to developing more interesting things. That being said, what we've done is we've separated all of our interactions into kind of subgroups and then we've created a hierarchy with those subgroups using inheritance. So the simplest way to show you this is by looking at our door and our door interaction. Now I did briefly talk about this in the pre previous episode. Um, but we have our abstract interaction, our rotatable interaction, and our door interaction. These are three different scripts, and they define different things. Uh, what's most important to notice is that the rotatable interaction will have the variables and the necessary data that it will share between the door, the switch, and the wheel. If you'll look in the file system on the left, you'll notice that all three of these are subdirectories of the rotatable interaction. And if I go ahead and open up the scripts, we'll see here at the very top that all of our scripts inherit from the rotatable interaction. So we have a class name wheel and that extends from rotatable. If I go to my switch, you'll see that we have a class name switch, which extends from rotatable and same goes for the door, obviously. Rotatable in and of itself extends from our abstract interaction, which is our top level, highest level inherited class. As you can see, there's not a lot of logic in these. The biggest point of the refactoring was that the interaction component here was simply way too long, simply way too gangly, and we just have, look at all these variables. I mean, most of these are just not necessary. All of these different velocity thresholds, they're better used as arguments or just parsed through uh, per the classes themselves. Um, so the big thing with the door here, you'll see that all of our rotatables here will have a movement sound and a max rotation. If I click on my switch here, you'll see that it also has a movement sound and a max rotation, even though the sound and the rotation themselves are different. And so that's kind of the big pinpoint here with the inheritance refactor. We can define what we need, but we don't have to define exactly what it is. So let's go ahead and look at some code. So in our abstract interaction script, which is our top level highest um, interaction class, you'll see that it just extends node. And all we really wanna do is get the basics set up. So we have a can interact, is interacting, lock camera. These are all variables that already existed and we no longer assign the object reference. We're just getting the parent. So we're kind of setting an expectation that we want the um, interaction component, whether that be a switch door, uh, grabbable, etc., to be just one below the parent node. And we want all of our interactions to be able to execute. So we define the notify node method up here in the abstract interaction script. Um, this method and any of these uh, methods here can be called by the child. So if we come down to the switch script, you'll see that right here um, in the process function, if we're pulling the switch, it's still sending that notified node single uh, signal with the percentage. Um, even though notify nodes is not a method here, if I hover over it, you'll see that it's the abstract interaction notify nodes, um, which once again, that allows us to reuse logic, which was a big point of this refactor. Um, another thing I wanna point out is that all of our interaction classes will be using the pre-interact, interact, and post-interact. That's obviously still the same. That's kind of a big part of the way we design the controller. Um, but you'll notice if I go to the grabbable, you'll notice that what they do is they call super, and super just refers to the parent class 
uh, the method in the parent class that has the same name. So here you'll see we have our interact and that calls super. So that way, our, a better example is probably the post interact. So we have our post interact here that calls super on the grabbable. And remember the grabbable is the box. So if I go ahead and run the game here, I'll run over to the box. So when I first click on the box, that's a pre-interact and now I'm interacting. And as I let go, the box drops because we stopped interacting. And that's because we call super here and that calls this method here, this post interact, which sets interacting to false and unlocks the camera. And this works, um, we have it set up um, through all of our uh, class structure. So even though the wheel interaction is a child of the rotatable, which is a child of the abstract, because they all call super, they go up the chain and kind of build up all of the necessary variables. So now I think I'm just gonna kind of go one by one and talk about the differences between them. I think one big thing I want to point out first is not actually in any of the interactions, but in the interaction controller. So just as a reminder, the interaction controller is different from the interaction component, obviously. This is the node that sits on the player and that's interacting with our interaction ray cast. And it's kind of how we figure out if we're looking at a wall or if we're looking at a object we can actually pick up. The only thing I'm gonna point out in this is that you'll see that instead of having if interaction component dot interaction type is or equals equals that long gangly whatever that was, you'll notice that now we can just say if the interaction is a grabbable, if it is collectible, if it is a door. Um, and so these are just the class names that we define. So once again, a grabbable is our typical box. You can see grabbable interaction is the class name. So the interaction con uh, controller um, still checks through what we're interacting with. Um, and then it'll be like, hey, is, you know, is this a grabbable interaction? And that's defined on the class. And if it is, we'll go ahead and do our own thing. Um, as you can see, we've had to change around a few of the different functions. So before we were sending the player hand in the pre-interact, um, but we've refactored that because we don't want to send the hand in a pre-interact because we had it set up. In fact, I can probably just pull up the interaction component here. Um, we had it set up where we were sending the hand always, but it was only ever not null on the default object. That's not necessarily a problem, but it is a little clunky. It should really be set up like this. Um, you know, obviously, and then we only want to set up the signal if it's an item. Uh, we only want to set up the note collected signal if it's a note like that. So this also simplifies some logic that is outside of the interaction component itself. Um, and it, it just looks much cleaner. And I think it's much easier to understand looking at it like this. So anyway, the abstract interaction, I think we went over this one, just sets interacting to true, sets these back to false, and it does allow us to interact with various nodes. Um, that being said, like all of these variables are accessible in the child classes. So can interact is defined on the, let me go ahead and go back to the sandbox here on the switch uh, can interact is defined on the abstract interaction but if we go to the sorry let's go to the grabbable interaction you can actually see that we can check if that can interact was set so if we can't interact go ahead and return and don't interact so this variable is not defined in this class as you can see it's defined in the abstract but once again because we inherit from the abstract we can use it um, the grabbable is very simple. All we do is set up the audio and the ready as well as setting up the bodied entered signal so that way we can uh, play the sound effect. The interact is still the same. We just move the rigid body towards the player's hand. Um, the throw is the exact same. We still have the throw strength and we make sure the player can't interact, you know, things of that nature. So all of the all of the logic is still the same from the interaction component. It's still in the same aux interact, fire collision. Um, it's just in a different script. So nothing there has really changed. Um, the collectible is the exact same. All we really do is fire the item collected signal and then play the sound effect. So you can even see here just 60 lines of code. And if you took out all of the comments and spacing, it's probably closer to 40. It's just a much cleaner um, implementation. If we go to our inspectable, the inspectables are the, um, the inspectables are the notes. Um, someone in my Discord, I think, came up with the name um, inspectable instead of note, which I really like because if you look at the note, when you grab it, it kind of comes into your left hand and then you have some kind of information on the right. Um, inspectable is good because you could almost treat it as like a murder mystery game or something. 
Um, so maybe I have a bloody knife in my left hand and that I can get some kind of clue or deduce on the right side of the screen. So I think inspectable is a good name for it. But once again, all of this logic is the exact same as well. You know, you just add the child, you set up the audio player and add it. Um, we changed the mesh layer so that way the sub viewport renders it correctly, um, plays the sound effect, all that stuff. It's, it's, it's really simple. It's all the same logic that was in the interaction component. Once again, just in a, a new script. Um, one thing I do want to point out is the rotatable interaction. This is probably the most complicated of the lot. Um, we define all of the variables needed here um, in the quote unquote parent class, um, but we don't really use them unless we are in the child class. So just as an example here, you'll see this angular velocity, how fast the rotatable object is moving on a given frame. This is never touched in this class. It's never used to calculate anything. Um, but if you go down like into your switch, you'll see every frame we're setting our angular velocity. And that's true for the wheel as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, the rotatable interaction abstracts all of that out. So it keeps those scripts uh, very simple. But it also, and I think I made mention of this in the original video, that all of the movement uh, sound effects were pretty much identical. The logic for it is. Um, and so here we only have one play movement sounds that is shared between all three of our interactions. So calculate the velocity, set the target volume based on how fast the object is moving, and then play it. And that's you know the same kind of idea for the stop movement. So here in Switch, you'll see that if we're interacting, we want to try to play movement sounds. So you can see there, rotatable interaction dot play movement sounds. So once again, we're reusing a lot of code here. Um, and then the wheel and the door are pretty much identical to the Switch that I've been showing. Um, just with the few necessary variables, like the door needs to know if it's the front and then if it's just unlocked, things like that. Um, we're still exporting if it is locked and the pivot point on the door as well, because those are unfortunately necessary things that we need to set up to get this working. And then I think the final one is the typable. The typable is just the keypad. That's the only one we have. But once again, if we wanted to, we could always expand to make this into like a, a computer of some sort. You have to actually manually type something of that. Um, so typable is a good name for it, um, and this is, once again, the exact same logic. We call super through all the interacts to make sure the player is interacting with it, and then the press button is the same exact code that we wrote in that video. Once again, all of this is on my GitHub. I know I kind of sped through all of that, um, but this really isn't like a fun video to make. The last video was a fun video to make, but I know I've kind of geared my videos uh, towards newer players, and I think that's why I got a lot of uh, constructive criticism, we'll call it, on the last video, because there's a lot of different ways you can do this controller. But the biggest design principle, I guess, I was worried about with my videos, um, I didn't want to just create something and show it and be like, hey, here's what I did. I wanted to be able to replicate it for new Godot devs who may have no idea what they're doing, who may not understand programming at all. Um, and so while there are definitely cons to using inheritance, I think it's a very easy concept to get. You have an abstract interaction uh, let's do the rotatable. So you have a abstract interaction that gives its logic to the rotatable interactions that gives its logic to the switch interaction. Or better yet, a switch is an object that rotates. So it's a rotating object and it's an object we can interact with. So it's an abstract interact object. Um, I'm sure I will run into some problems doing it this way. Of course, that's how any software development will ever work in this life. Um, but I think newer developers who are watching my videos will be able to make sense of it themselves as well. So once again, check out the GitHub for all the code changes. Check out my Discord using the link in the description below. Um, if you have kind of a half-developed project that you now have to do with the refactor, please join my Discord. I'm happy to help. Um, I know this is a big change uh, moving forward. But now that I said my piece, I feel like I can move on and work on some more fun stuff. I want to do some puzzle creation. I want to uh, have the player kind of um, pick up objects and like have to put a battery in a slot to turn the power on or uh, build something like a pressure plate, something that's more fun and not just so code heavy. And all of my videos after this will be step by step where I go through line by line with code and teaching uh, not just what we're writing, but how we're writing. So stick around for that. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe, leave a comment, leave a like, uh, join my discord and help me grow my community. Thanks to everyone who made it this far in the video. I will see you all in the next one. <laughs>